All right, Tom, they're talking about um, racing squared. So you support owners and trainers in purchasing elite horses through the application of data science. Um, you've already really given us the, you've given us the sort of explanation yeah. of it. Is there anything more to it than what you've already told us? I've got here application of data science, machine learning technology and advanced analytics. So basically, have you explained what that is or is there more to it than so that? It's a lot of buzzwords, isn't it? Um, I think maybe let's explain it in practical terms. Um, so at the moment, there is um, a big sale on in Keeneland in, in, in America. So it's kind of mid-September when we're do doing the interview. Um, now, that's the biggest yearling sale uh, in the world. So you've got 4,000 yearlings that are kind of going through the sales ring in Keeneland. I've got a, a couple of partners that we're working with over there. One's an American trainer out of New York and one is a trainer out of Dubai. But um, so how it works, what we do is kind of work with the trainers up front. Often what we'll do is we'll do some kind of pedigree profiling and pedigree modeling. Um, and then based on pedigree data, produce kind of a short list of horses and expected ability ratings. Um, what I use in the UK is official ratings because that's kind of our ability currency here. What I use in the US is bear figures. It's kind of their ability kind of rating equivalent or kind of handicapping methodology. Um, so we'll do that. We'll build up a short list from that. Then what we'll do is kind of closer to the sale, we take the videos of the horses walking, run it through the biomechanics software that I mentioned, kind of put the key markers on the body parts, kind of annotate that video, take some of the measurements like the joint angles and that type of stuff. Um, run that through then our kind of different um, machine learning models. I use Google Cloud quite a lot. Um, it can kind of pay for some of their kind of algorithmic services. Um, it's quite expensive, but you basically can piggyback on Google's infrastructure and then like run all of your, your data through there. So we run that and then that gives us a, also a kind of biomechanic rating, let's put it that way. Then what I do is I, um, we compare the two and generally what we're looking for in the methodology is hot, two quadrants really. Horses that score elite on pedigree and also elite on biomechanics are a pretty good bet. <laughs> you've basically got two super positive indicators and you've got two kind of pr predictive, strongly predictive models, m m uh, models that are giving you a kind of a positive um, rating on that horse. The other technique that I like to use is horses with poor pedigrees but strong biomechanics. Now they're often the value players because basically you're not getting a strong pedigree profile or page but you're getting a good mover. Um, and they're often, I mean, you always have to pay for a pedigree, so they're often the ones where there's a, a value angle that you can exploit a little bit. Then what we do is we take that data, that gives us a short list, um, then it's over to the vet at the sale. So vet then does the round based on the, the short list, does physicals on all of the horses, does a full physical evaluation, gives them a physical rating. Um, we'll then do scopes, x-rays, so we'll check wind, so we'll do a scope and check the wind, either if there's a scope in the repository we'll use that or we'll scope them ourselves if we need to, any x-rays, like if there's any tendons that need scanning, that type of stuff, and then we'll take the vet's physical rating and compare it to the biomechanic or the pedigree ratings or the kind of amalgamation of those ratings and that'll then form the horses that we go after, so it's as I've said at the start, you're almost using a bit of a human model or a human evalu uh, evaluation. You're combining it with the computer evaluation and from that you're, you're trying to find good horses. So do I assume you're on the hotline to the vet that's over there and get them to check out the yeah, horses? Yeah, yeah. So send them, send them a, like a text or a WhatsApp in the morning with the profile. We'll go around and we'll do some written evaluations or a couple of voice notes for us with their feedback and kind of their score and then we crunch it together. Um, and that's the that's pretty much the the methodology end to end and then you've got the the next battle is trying to win them in the in the auction and in the sales ring so that's the worst thing when you see something that you really like and i was beat on one last week it was an inns of court that um also went to i think a very clever syndicate king or bloodstock agency king's bloodstock i think they do quite a lot of analytical work so it's interesting to see certain teams on the same horses 
Um, but quite liked him last week. I got outbid on him. I stopped at eight and a half, and I think he went for nineteen. But I mean, that's the game in the sales ring. You win some, you you lose some, but you kind of have an expected value that you place on each horse based on their profile, and you try and stick to that. It's like it's like any bet really. You want something for a value price, and if some if, if you want to be price sensitive, and if the price goes, then you've got to let it go. There's plenty more horses kind of still to come over the course of the year. Okay, now I was t- I was speaking to a guy that I I know who's active in the sales ring, yeah. and he does it all by eye. So he was genuinely yeah, interested yeah. that I was talking to you. So he's given me a, f- a few pointers for questions. So these have come from somebody in the game that you yeah, know yeah. wants wants to know. Um, this first question would be: You work remotely from videos. Is that a disadvantage when it's hard to tell how big a horse is? Yeah. So that's where we use the vet. So my video algorithms and the scores there purely a kind of scoring on movement. So they're not necessarily based on size or proportions of the horses. And actually I say what we found is, actually what you get is you get the scores of horses that are really good movers, but they might be a bit small and they might even be too small to say like really to then achieve their kind of ability potential. So that's why you have to layer in the human element as well. That's why you have to have someone doing a physical ex- inspection. And again, based on the profile, that might be something you compromise on or something you sacrifice. You say, God, it's a good mover, but it's a bit on the small side, but hey, maybe we can live with it at the, the right price. But So yeah, not considering size and proportion, just movement, but we do it on the, the human side as well. Okay, well, these next question is probably going to be a similar answer. Yeah. Then. Um, so the main concern for people buying horses is confirmation and wind. How do you make a judgment by video? But yeah. same, the- same thing, vet. Um, do the wind on the scopes, get the vet to scope them. I am um, no confirmation expert. Um, I will completely defer to the people that really are and kind of super impressed by the people that are. But I suppose I'm a big believer you've got to stick with like your own skill set or your own kind of, I call it edge or call it tool, um, but then supplement that then with the expertise of different people. So that's why we try and build up a bit of a collective picture okay and i think if my information is right you said you can get a wind test after you've bought a horse pending yeah. Yeah. purchase yeah so is, do you do that or yeah we do that often what you get from the sales companies is you can add on like the option for a wind test so yeah we always do that as well it's just a kind of matter of due diligence or a bit of a health check okay so i want to go back to something you mentioned in part one mm. um that you your mate james and you did the, the northern gamblers podcast yeah so you told me before we did the interview that you've got no family background in racing or betting yeah. and you got interested at 16. So, I mean, where did that spark of interest come from? Yeah, it's a, it's a good one, isn't it? I just think it's um, a fascinating sport and a, a magical sport. Like it's, it's almost the greatest puzzle. Even if you were trying to design the greatest puzzle in the world, you probably wouldn't come up with anything as intricate and as multi kind of faceted and multi layered as horse racing. I mean, you've just got, you've got the, the races themselves and the composition and the variables in the race, the horse, the jockey, the trainer, the track, the tactics, but then you've got the wider kind of full system or infrastructure of horse racing, kind of the, the different training centers, the different populations, the different jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictions, the strengths between them, the breeding game, the bloodstock game. I um, yeah, I just think it's an absolute wonderful tapestry that you can almost never, it's infinite, you can never get to the bottom of it. I mean, I've spent 18 years trying to figure it out and certainly haven't got anywhere near cracking it, nor little bits and bobs at this point, but I think it's a fascinating puzzle and I've got quite an analytical kind of mind, I would say. Um, I was a management consultant for almost a decade um, for my sins. Um, and it's kind of a lot of those then business practices are kind of what I employ then in my kind of study of, uh, of racing as well. Um, I think also I've been quite fortunate over the years, like with mentors and education and that type of stuff. Cause there isn't, there isn't like a, a course on how to, on how to understand horse racing you you have to learn it by doing and you have to learn it by skinning the game that's also the magic and the beauty of it um but as i said james and i worked very closely for many years just kicking ideas and angles about that taught us a lot 
just having someone as a sparring partner that you can talk through form, talk through the dynamics of a race. I had a guy for a couple of years, a guy called Rob, who was a, who was a real kind of mentor to me, taught me a lot of kind of the data aspects. Um, a brilliant guy, I would say you've got like famous guys like Alan Woods and Bill Benter, kind of the great thinkers. I would put this guy on the same level, basically. He taught me a lot about kind of data modeling, feature engineering, understanding different variables about horse racing. So very thankful to him. And I mentioned Byron Rogers, and as I say, when it comes to a lot of the biomechanics stuff, but Byron's been a, a very good coach. So learned quite a lot that way. So been fortunate to, to meet some good people kind of at the time and some of the right people. Um, but I think it, a lot of us just got kind of an endless appetite for investigation at the game and it gives you that opportunity to just keep going forever and invent new disciplines like biomechanics. <laughs> Who knows what technology will now open up? Probably a lot more. So how, I'm assuming that you weren't punting at 16, so did you sort of land with your feet on the ground and ready to take the bookies on at 18 when you were... No, definitely not. <laughs> no. I'm Simon, mean, I'm not a I'm not a great better to be honest. I'm not a great gambler. Like I've tried over the years and anyone who's seen me on Twitter will know. Like had some great highs, had some real like like some good periods, like putting tips on Twitter and doing fabulous. Had some terrible lows, like absolutely like busting banks and kind of long losing runs. Um so I've kind of learned it by practice over the years and like nothing, nothing is, nothing is wasted. Like even when you have a big losing run, it's a, it's a great gift because losing runs can be a great teacher in terms of mentality, in terms of discipline, in terms of resilience. So like, yeah, I've, um, I've punted on and off for probably 18 years now and I've had good months and good years and I've had bad years and I've, build banks and have blown banks and have learned everything in between. You must so. be the only person on Twitter that doesn't win every week. Ah, yeah, um, and, and finally, I mean, there's lots of um, podcasts out there yeah. at the minute. Um, but when you started doing it, there wasn't, it was a relatively new thing. So why did you, why did you decide to, you and James, to do a podcast? Um, I kind of got drunk one night um, and just decided that we were spending that much time talking about horse racing between each other we might as well stick a, a microphone in the middle um and it was just meant as a bit of fun really um and it, as you say it was before the massive influx of podcasts i wouldn't say we were the were the first but like one of the first couple that you would see popping up on twitter and it was just a chance that we were doing all the work anyway so and you, you just thought oh, well let's let's put it out there and see if people enjoy it thankfully a couple of people did I used to get a couple of hundred listeners a week and try tried to do it with a I always try to do it with a bit of a different angle that it wasn't just about tipping it was also a bit about methodology um because that's what or, I mean you can probably tell it like as I say I'm not a great better I'm, I'm more of a researcher and it's what I enjoy and it's what my passion is but so we kind of tried to bring that a little bit in as well like what methodology how can you analyze races how can you analyze kind of different systems and that type of stuff in horse racing. So I think hopefully people enjoyed it. And is, the po is that it now? Is there a chance that it might resurface at some point? Oh, we, we, do a, we do a special every year. We do a classics special every year. Um, and James tips a big winner of at least one of the classics every year. And I tip no winners every year. So it'll be back next year. 